So if you have your Bible with you, please turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to be reading, I'm not going to read it up front, but we will be reading it as I'm going through the, um, the first 11 verses. So, um, by the looks of things, Christ has been progressively nudged out of Christmas picture altogether. Um, and can there be anything more ironic than that at Christmas? You know, the hint... <clears throat> the hint about this time of year is actually, it's in the name, isn't it? I know, ta-da, surprise, surprise. Yep, even looking for clip art, you know what clip art is, part of the kind of graphic thing? You'll find tons of things about season's greetings. What, I don't even know what that means. Does anybody actually know what that means, season's, season's greetings? Um... But scant got to do with Christ himself. But you'll be happy to know that the baby Jesus lost absolutely no sleep at this kind of glaring omission about Christmas. So let me, <clears throat> let me say it and let me ask it um, a question that I've been thinking about, most certainly over the last couple of years, but specifically as I was preparing this mes message. Does Jesus even care about Christmas? Um, it's not that easy to answer. It really isn't. You think it'd be an easy question to answer, but it actually isn't. You can probably guess that he's watching right now this world of materialism and rejection and debauchery. A lot of, I remember lots of my Christmases before, before you know, I became a Christian uh, that accompanied so-called celebrations. Uh, so we have no doubt about what he would say about all of these things. But what about those who profess Christ and profess faith in Christ, is it even possible that we find ourselves driving past Bethlehem every year, maybe missing the purposes of his coming? In our last few weeks, as we do every year, and what you've done for years here is you've looked at the facts and the eyewitness testimony, and you've looked at the meaning of the incarnation of Christ, the eternal Son of God, uh, second person of the Holy Trinity, was made flesh. Yeah? So we looked at the expectations, if you've been looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke and reading the Christmas stories, you'd see the expectations of the religious and the powerful of which Jesus is not impressed. Instead, his coming is surrounded by the least and the forgotten, a young believer called Mary, an aging couple called Elizabeth and Zacharias, a whole bunch of forgotten sheep, shepherds, and among others, this is who he's come to. And the great sign, of course, was that the king of kings shared a dwelling with animals, and his bed is a feeding trough. But what I want for us in a few minutes to reflect on not the simple facts, you know that already, you probably know it backwards. Not even the important testimonies of eyewitnesses. Not even the mind-blowing meaning of why he came. But how are we meant to apply the message of Christmas? How are we, how are we to apply the message of Christ's incarnation? For this I can safely say yes. Christ deeply cares about Christmas. So in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 1 is actually one of the most important verses intended by Christ for us to actually understand Christmas. And yet it doesn't look like it. Philippians 2 and verse 1. Let me read it. Therefore, if... Now that's an unusual word, if, there, because we think it's kind of like a fearful if. It's not. It, in its context, it means, since there is absolutely without a shadow of doubt or speculation or question. That's what's behind that if. 
If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, they're the four things. It's not meant to suggest that there might not be these things, but rather, if we have experienced these things in our lives, we know them then to be absolutely true. If we know we're in Christ. But for us in our day, for sobriety's sake, the context is really important in this chapter. Because just before it, because Paul starts off with therefore, he's pointing back to a previous verse which tells us that Christians must expect to live in a world that opposes the true meaning of Christmas. And on that basis, he calls us as a church to unity. So the absolute facts are these. There is encouragement in Christ. There is comfort and consolation in the Father's love. There is the desire of the Spirit to draw us together into a closer fellowship. And there is an affection and compassion of his church. When we're truly in Christ, he came to reconcile us to God by his cross. He was born to give us eternal life. His birth carries the blessing of an accredited righteousness. It's not very Christmasy language, is it? But that's what's going on. A righteousness that we don't have before a holy, loving God and to make us share in his eternal inheritance. Now, these are the most obvious things and the clearest teaching of Scripture. His coming into the world is to bring us all of these things and more. So, yes, he cares about his own coming into the world because the Scripture says he came to serve from the cradle to the cross. He cares about Christmas. And now he calls us to live it. So how do we connect his coming, which we do every year, how do you connect that with living it out? I think it's meant to be more than everyone looking forward to the Christmas dinner as much as we do. So what is living out Christmas? Well, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul continues, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. In other words, Christmas to Christ is the call for a radical otherness and an other-centered faith. That's the message of his coming from heaven to earth. That's the message, by the way, of him not just coming in a, a castle, but in a, in a cradle that was used to feed animals. It's a call for radical otherness, a community united in love, love for God, and expressed through each other. And in the following verses, Paul gives us now this basis for otherness. You're thinking, this is not Christmassy. This is not, doesn't sound, where's the jingle bells in here? It's not here. But let's just look at 3 to 11 and you'll see what the rest of the writers interpret about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about Christmas. This is the way, this is the way they talk about it. Verse 3, always. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not look for your own... Merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of Christ. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And now he gives us the Christmas message. Who, although he existed in the, existed in the form of God, did not e regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a of servant, and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God, for this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Interesting. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory 
of God the Father. You see, a king in a manger was not an unfortunate happenstance of history. It's a revelation of God's heart. It's his radical plan for us in the world, revealed by how he came into the world in coming the way he did. He shows us how the purpose of us coming into the world can enable us to break free from the chain of tinsel that binds the hearts of the lost. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important. So strip away everything about our culture, just for this morning, that em the, 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 their emphasis about Christmas and we're left with two essential things for us to get to the heart of what this day really means. Number one, God came in flesh. Now, here's where I need you to think for a minute. The passage that we've just read that emphasizes his coming into the world, coming into the world in flesh, parallels Verse 1, is there any encouragement in Christ? And you're thinking, it doesn't feel like it, and it doesn't look like it, but it absolutely is. So in what way? Well, back in verse 1, it says, we have a position in Christ. All of the things that he has done for us. And that should encourage us to face anything. Remember, for the joy set before him, he endures the cross. And is there support and comfort in the love of God and others? Well, yes, because love overcomes all things. And does the fellowship of the Spirit not desire to constantly create this relationship with God and one another? Well, of course he does. And does the work of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit, does it not call us to deeper affection and compassion? Of course, have this attitude in yourselves. We're not God. I want us to make sure we understand that. We're not God. But what we do have is an inheritance that can never be taken away from us. Something reserved in, reserved in heaven for us. And we are incredibly privileged. We are incredibly blessed with a position that all of the benefits of being in Christ are ours. That's why we sing joyful and triumphant. And so the parallel is actually clear if you meditate on this section. Christ existed in the form of God. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. But it's hidden in his humanity. People didn't walk up to Jesus and say, there's God. In flesh. But you see, as his children, what's the parallel? Well, the very same power that's in Christ was it's also now in us. To live out what the world craves. And that is a deliverance from the selfish, self-centered slavery to destructive, ingrained habits and propels us into a new freedom along the journey of otherness. In other words, in his divinity, he had the utter freedom to give himself away in his humanity. That's what Christ actually did in that passage. And he calls us blessed beyond measure in Christ. We're not Christ. But we are so blessed that we can afford to do exactly the same thing. Thing, that's the meaning of Christmas. He comes from heaven to earth to show that all the incredible blessings, the privileges that we have, which we will experience in our fullness when Christ returns, we can afford to be humble, gracious, and united because of all of these things. He became a man. You know what we sing? Pleased as man with man to dwell. Was that humility? Well, we, in a way, we can't even fathom it. But so must we in the same way. I heard someone say that the meaning of the book of Luke 
by the way, it shows us the incredible humanity of Christ, is that the gospel isn't meant to just make us more spiritual, wonderful as that is, growing in Christ by the power of the Spirit. It's meant to make us far more human. We must enter the world of desperate needs with radical love. Well, how? Well, God came in the flesh. But the passage emphasizes that Christ came as a servant. He became a servant. Remember? Mild he lay his glory by. Jesus said, I came. His own interpretation of, the, of him coming to earth. I came not to be served, but to serve. There's Jesus' meaning for Christmas. And to give my life as a ransom for many. So he came as a servant and he dies, according to Philippians. Born that man no more may die. To raise the sons of earth and to give them second birth. And so must we, maybe not physically, although that might be asked, but rather no greater love, Christ says, than for us to lay down our lives for one another, but also to die to our own selfishness and our own agendas and our own plans. So for us this Christmas, what are we taking home? Well, in exactly the same way that you find all the Christmas accounts, they all worship they all worship. God highly exalts him, bestows on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, what does it say? Every knee will bow. That's Christmas. That's the response to the incarnation. All oh, the competition we have on this day. Presents and kids and Christmas trees and meals and, and the wonderful, and I love it all. I'm, I'm a total fan of Christmas. I love the whole thing. But it can't ever nudge out Christ. This is the central part, isn't it? That our knees today touch the floor and, and worship. Because at his birth, shepherds and angels and visitors from the east and Elizabeth, Zacharias, our relatives and our neighbors, Simeon and Anna, they all rejoice. They all worship and they all serve. And so it will be when those in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow before him. So yes, Christ cares about Christmas because his coming strengthens us. His love comforts us and we're going to need it in these days coming. And because his spirit binds us together in his fellowship, we're going to need that more than ever. Because through his kindness and compassion in us, he calls us to stand firm and strive together in unity. And that's a Merry Christmas. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we sometimes have forgotten that there is a, 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 pur a purpose and a meaning, but an application for what? Uh, for, for, all of e for each of us this morning, as we think about this incredible event, that we're lost in wonder, but sometimes we forget that it's, not, it's a wonder that's meant to be applied, not just in our worship, not just in our understanding of the incredible things you have done for us, to call us back to the gospel of repentance and faith, to go into the world as the most human people possible, in the power of your Holy Spirit, and bring this love to a lost world. But you call us, before all of that, you call us to a unity and a striving together. Because by this, all men will know that we believe Christmas when we have love for one another. We bless you for each other. We look forward to what this message does to the hearts of each one here this morning as we look forward to the celebrations of this day that you will be lifted up and glorified God in our midst for you are the reason in Jesus name
Amen. Come on up and close us in a song.